Today we're meeting a maker called Nick and he's going to tell you how you can go from your steady job to building a business based on your passions. Last year, I started a series called Meet a Maker, and in the first episode, we met Miles. Miles runs a successful business with 3D printing at the core. Now, I met Nick in education at the last school I taught at before leaving to do full-time YouTube, and Nick's got a really interesting career, and he ended up leaving teaching at one stage to start his own business. So we're gonna learn about his interests, his passions, and you should get some good tips, so you might be able to do the same. I met you teaching, but tell us about your background. What's your qualification? I've got a mechanical engineering degree um, and about 10 years in the engineering world and then a Bachelor of Teaching with specialising in mathematics with about 10 years teaching as well. You're teaching mathematics, but you're also teaching engineering as well yeah, when we met? Yeah, teaching engineering, some technology subjects as well, um, industrial timber, a uh, bit of multimedia stuff, jack of all trades kind of thing. Really, yeah. And when you were in engineering, what was your specialty? Spent um, a lot of time working for a company who resold engineering analysis software, so finite element analysis CFD. And I did consulting with it, I sold the software, I trained people to use it. Um, and so had a range, like experience with a range of different projects, like 30 something projects in five years. How would you explain FEA for, in a nutshell? It's basically virtual prototyping. So instead of, let's say, best example, one of the best examples is car crashing. A car company, it costs them a million dollars to crash one of their cars to do a car test. You can do that all virtually. So you build a model in the computer, you crash the car, it's all based on real physics, get it as close as possible to right, if not right, and then do the crash test. So you cut out the need to do 10 crash tests. It's a far more economical and a, yeah, better way to do it. Obviously, most people watching this channel are interested in 3D printing and CNC routing, laser cutting, etc. Did you use any of those tools? Uh, when I was teaching? When teaching yeah. um, no, I didn't actually. I didn't until I stopped teaching and started my own, own businesses, just uh, like a fix it foster um, bikes and engineering business. And, and also for my personal use, just making different bits and pieces for my bikes, my cars, all that sort of stuff. Judging by the mills in the background, your skill set is more with traditional engineering tools? Yeah, and look, I, I've always wanted to lay a mill for years and years, and I did some work when I just finished my engineering degree in the early 2000s. I was working for a, actually a bike shop. I also had a bit of a machine shop, and so we'd be making suspension parts and that sort of stuff. And in the back of my mind, I'd always wanted to tool up a bit, and um, I finally did um, kind of early last year as part of a fi Fix It Foster business. All right, so Fix It Foster. So a lot of people have a 3D printer and think, I want to make money from it. So obviously 3D printing wasn't the only thing you did. Yeah. So what type of services and projects did you take on? I guess the one of the biggest things that I used 3D printing for was um, for prototyping. So um, I was, one of the jobs I had was restoring an old BMW, um, a 73 E9 CSI, a very rare car, and the parts just aren't available. So, and we're also, it was a modern resto, um, so we were upgrading it to be a modern, reliable car. I'd make brackets to fit first with the printing because it's so cheap and easy just to pump out lots of different iterations and then I'd go and get them fabricated out of metal. So you generally used it to template before a metal part would be made. Did you end yeah. up with any parts that remained 3D printed on the car? Yeah, so some of the bracketry for the, the fan, um, the cooling fan, um, some of the other components like yeah, the idle control valve. Uh, there's some other bits and pieces for manifold, um, vacuum manifolds and things like that as well. Um, things where they're just like there was no part for it. You just had to make it um, because it was a is a custom custom fit. So this car's all running and good now. Um, BMW. The engine's running, but it's gone to another mechanic to do the final fit out interior, all the light surrounds, and and all those sorts of things. <laughs> I think I remember with Fix It Foster, you also offered as a service that you would fix other people's 3D printers, is that correct? Yeah, well, I, I helped, um, there's a, a young student up the road who was having trouble, so 
Um, he came down with his printer, we pulled it apart, worked out what was wrong, or well, he pretty much pulled it apart just with my guidance. Um, and he, he ended up, we ended up fixing it together. So, but my philosophy was to teach people how to fix stuff. So with the bike business, I'd get them to come in and I'd teach them how to fix their bikes, which is maybe not a good business model, but um, I'd prefer to teach people how to do it. So they're empowered to do it themselves. Yeah, what you're doing is far more democratic for making and yeah. generous. So yeah. yeah, I suppose that's an idea for um, anyone who is looking to make some money with their 3D printer. They don't necessarily just have to sell parts. They can consider their knowledge as something to sell as well. I kind of think that if you if you give if you give something back, then um, you'll usually it, things will work out and um, other things will come back to you. I guess I guess it's a karma kind of thing. Yeah. So now that you do have a 3D printer and had one for a while, um, have you done any hobby parts? Yeah, my mountain bike, I've made a chain guide and a pump bracket. Um, I've got some other projects kind of under wraps at the moment that I'd like to like to work on, which the 3D printer will definitely come in. They'll be like electromechanical kind of projects. And so we're working on your printer today. What, yeah. are, we, what are we aiming to change on that? Um, so I've had some challenges with printing the Apollo X with um, interlayer adhesions. So, and in my mind, it's down to the temperature. I can't get it to print over 235 degrees. So um, it requires a firmware upgrade. So it's, it's erroring, it won't go over 235 degrees. Hopefully we'll get there with that firmware upgrade. You're not long for Australia. What's the next step in your career? Uh, so I've been um, employed by a um, school called the Liger Academy, which um, was started by a couple, um, they started a school in Cambodia actually, and it's a school to raise the leaders of tomorrow. So um, teaches entrepreneurial skills, problem solving skills, and they are starting a school in New Zealand. And I'm gonna go over there and be a facilitator slash teacher, teacher for them. Um, so we'll be going as soon as the bubble opens. Um, the school starts shortly after that. So. Yeah, so it's facilitating um, projects often with a community impact and, and also there'll be a te technology kind of program for them with 3D printing and, and milling and um, making stuff and fixing stuff and um, whatever else we want to do. It's very, it's kind of like a limitless learning model. We're not really bound by a curriculum. We will offer the New Zealand curriculum, but we're not bound by it. So it's pretty exciting kind of environment to, to work in. Teaching is a job that gives you a lot of creativity on what you design programs for the kids to learn. So it sounds like an even more exaggerated version of that. One of the things we talk about is opportunity-based pathways. So you might start, the, the kids in Cambodia would start one project um, on, they were tidying up one project, they were tidying up their coastal areas and that led to, led to looking at marine species and all learning to scuba dive and then being part of creating an artificial reef and designing that with the, with the marine um, society over there. So there's you know, all these opportunities that can open up and having real, no limits on that as well, um, other than there's, some, there's a lot of learning involved and um, you know, the kids will get a lot out of it. So. so what would be your main criteria in picking a 3D printer to go into a school? My, my criteria for a printer was um, being able to print consistently, being able to print different materials. Being able to set that up easily so the kids can get on and say they want to print in nylon, then just picking the nylon settings and not having to go through. Um, there's a safety aspect, so it's enclosed. Um, it's got a, the, one, the ones that I was looking at have HEPA filters on them, so they take away um, a lot of the, the fumes involved. And with teaching kids, they have to be able to get onto it quickly and, and see the results of what they're doing. Time to tinker and play around is, I guess, is, is can be limited. So, so, so they're really my main main criteria. Okay, so you went from a steady job in teaching, and then you left teaching to start your own business. I'm guessing it was kind of hard to make that leap. So, what advice would you have for someone who's looking to maybe start making money from 3D printing, but doesn't want to risk it all or is worried about that? Okay, so I guess like. The, the actual hardest thing for me was actually starting. Creating the content for the Facebook so the business page wasn't hard, but hosting the website and actually starting. And um, I guess my advice would be work out what your values are, trust that you can actually do it, and, um, and just do it because what's the worst that can happen? I mean, obviously, if you have um, a family and, and all those sorts of things, you've got to take that all into consideration. I'm not saying just jump, 
jump ship kind of thing. People don't have to quit their job completely, do they? They can yeah. just start on the side and see how it grows from there. Yeah, just start incrementally, just test, test little things out, offer some services that aren't going to take, aren't going to be a full-time job and just see if you like it. I actually had a play with a YouTube channel at one stage and found that it just wasn't quite for me. Like the, the video editing was kind of crazy, like crazy time. And I just, fun. yeah. <laughs> so I just, Not fun. yeah. So then I thought, well, what do I love doing? I love getting in the shed and making stuff and fixing stuff. So why don't I make that a business? And yeah, and that's what happened. I mean, I have a go, what's the worst that can happen and, and really just start because you, you're never going to have it perfect at the start. You've got to just refine as you go along. Nick, thank you very much for having me and for agreeing to this interview. I think your story is pretty interesting and I hope people watching agree and maybe there's something that really rang true with them. If that's you, please let me know what that is in the comments section. Even if it's just a really cool project like the ones we saw from Nick. Thank you so much for watching and hopefully we've inspired you to dip your toe in the water and follow your passions. Good one. <laughs> G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.